correct conditioning, and a sincere spirit of self-examination. Over time, anyone can achieve a powerful and genuine expression of themselves through the practice of Aikido. My name is Daniel Kempling. I'm a professional Aikido instructor, a personal trainer, as well as an instructor of the Pilates method. I believe that we as students of Aikido all strive to express power efficiently through our techniques and to safely neutralize that same power through the study of Ukemi. Now, if my own experience in these last 23 years of training are any indication, this is easier said than done. The obstacles to the expression of this relaxed power are many, and I would quickly embarrass myself should I try and address them all comprehensively. But what I will share with you are those physical conditioning methods that I found most impactful in my own practice and in that of my students and clients. It is worth noting that the first generation of Japanese Aikido teachers that came to the West came not only from a different culture, but kinesthetically speaking, moved with different bodies. Their legs were strong through their full range of motion, their hips were open and mobile, and their core musculature supported and mobilized a clear spinal line. This line in Japanese is referred to as Taijiku. It is precisely these physical qualities that are absent in so many of us. We recruit our strength as though we are upside down and spineless. In order to move ourselves coherently, we must contract our core muscles, our hara, as the situation demands. This coherency of motion is known as tuitsu tai in Japanese and points to an integration of movement, of a mind-body state, wherein each body part works in harmony with every other towards a common goal. Our problem is we place demands upon our upper torso and arms that are not initiated in the core nor clearly supported by the legs. It's like a house with a crooked foundation. Everything that's built upon it will be misaligned and weak. The good news is that our bodies are like servants that can read our minds. They will respond more coherently, powerfully, gracefully even, to the extent that we can form clear and accurate demands upon our muscular skeletal system. What this DVD aims to do then is help you with the quality of the mental images that you ask of your muscular system. Now let me share a confession with you. I've been trying to rid my body of unnecessary tension since about day one of my Aikido life. I've been as successful with this project as I have been with ridding my mind of unnecessary tensions and troubling thoughts. That is to say, not very successful at all. What I have learned to do, though, is to consciously move tension throughout my system and test its effectiveness against my Aikido practice. What follows, then, are some of my findings around what I call necessary tensions. For clarity's sake, I have divided this study into three priorities of muscular recruitment. These priorities are 1. To recruit the inside before the outside. 2. To recruit the bottom before the top. And 3. To draw on the back before the front. Towards the end, we will also look at how these principles apply in torsion and in lateral flexion. You will find that the pattern for each challenge addressed is this. Firstly, the technique or ukemi problem is examined through the lens of necessary tension. Secondly, a basic conditioning protocol is demonstrated to specifically address the problem, focusing on kinesthetic awareness. Thirdly, a more advanced exercise is shown addressing the same issue, yet focusing more on endurance and power. And fourth and finally, the technique or ukemi problem is revisited with a felt sense of the preceding exercises integrated into the movement. All right, let's get down to work. We'll begin our study here with moving from the inside outwards. Here we have Chuck and Gary working on this deceptively straightforward technique, Kokudosa. Chuck's aim is to put Gary onto his back, drawing power from his pelvis and his back and delivering it out his elbows and hence to his fingertips.
Chuck will find soon enough, though, that arm strength isn't enough. If there's a bend in his back, he loses that connection. How can we find some exercises to help him straighten the back and find that strong spinal power? The spine, as we know, is not one solid bone, but a series of connected vertebrae, like a suspended string of pearls. These vertebrae, especially here in the lumbar area, rely on our natural corset, our core muscles, to provide stability. Here Phyllis has rolled her pelvis forward to establish the suspended posture. I want her to find that corseting action that this deeper sheet of abdominal muscle provides. This wide muscle that encloses the abdomen from hip bones to floating ribs is called the transversus abdominis, or TA muscle. Phyllis finds this TA contraction by placing one hand lightly on her belly and then pulling inward with her navel to break contact with that hand. Try this contraction with the exhalation. Get the sense of that a few times, then holding the hips in contact with the heels, draw this TA in strongly, and now flex the straight spine vigilantly keeping your abdominal muscles pulled in, your tailbone anchored between your heels, and your belly, as always, drawn in and solid. Even as you hinge your ribs forward, try this eight to 10 times and return to Kokia Dosa, guarding that sense of core contraction as you flex forward. A bit more challenging method to strengthen this habit of core contraction is what I call a floater. Phyllis lays prone, elbows drawn in and downwards. First using a TA contraction, she pulls her belly away from the mats and hence floats the hips. To straighten the spine and breathing steadily, she holds for a 10 count. In and out one, in and out two, and so forth, up to 10. Try three or four sets of these and retain this quality of core contraction as you now revisit Kokidosa. With his navel drawn inward, Chuck projects a clear, straight spinal line into Gary and holds this stabilization to solidify the pin. We find now that we need to first stabilize the spine before we mobilize the spine. Here with Katadori Nikyo, Gary strives to express this clear spinal line from his tailbone to his shoulder, but Chuck, with a strong wrist, will not move without incentive. How can we help him find this strong line to increase this spinal flexion? Looking at what we call an ab prep in Pilates, Phyllis draws her belly inwards and hinges her chest toward her thighs. Holding us in stable with the in-breath, she exhales to ease back to the start position. It's useful to mention that the abs, that is the rectus abdominis, originate at the base of our sternum and insert here down at the pubic bone. We rotate the head forward to ease the neck's work, yet rather than throw her chin towards her knees, Phyllis engages her abs to draw the chest up the back of the neck long to set the head position properly. Do six ab preps, rest a moment, do six more. Now revisit Katadori Nikyo and initiate with this quality flexion. A more challenging abdominal exercise is the teaser. This calls for vigorous straight line flexion as well as great core stability to nail this V shape. With her feet Pulled out, her toes pointed, Phyllis begins by inhaling and floating her arms upwards. As they pass her ears, she exhales, hinges tall, abs and hip flexors working together. She holds stable with the in-breath and exhaling smoothly eases back to her start position, ready to begin again with the in-breath and the floating arms. Try four teasers, rest, do four more. Now revisit Katadori and refer to this vivid abdominal line as you apply Nikyo. With his tailbone planted low, Gary has a solid anchor for powerful spinal flexion. As he cinches 
the elbow to the ribs, he now can apply the spinal flexion into katagatame. By flexing the spine, he closes this distance and maintains a strong core contraction throughout. Shifting our study to the muscular demands of ukemi, we look now at the Sushiro back-arching ukemi called for here in Ryotsutori Kokunage. What can we do to help Chuck build this resiliency for this deep spinal extension? Again, we're studying how to move from the center outwards. Phyllis, lying prone, with her feet a bit wider than her shoulders, her elbows tucked down and in, floats her chest off the mat, holds solidly with the in-breath, shoulders pulled down, and exhaling, again, eases back to her start position. Phyllis is recruiting this web of spinal extensors and calling as well on her gluteal muscles to forge this strong bow shape in the spine. Make sure that you keep your elbows tucked in and the shoulders down and back, and project forcefully into the sternum forward, here. Try five of these swan dive preps, rest and then five more. After this much vigorous spinal extension, I recommend that you settle back and decompress into this shell stretch. Put the hips back on the heels and the ribs settling between the open knees. Creep your fingertips forward. Breathe steadily into the back and sides of the rib cage. Now carry this feeling of this strong spinal bow back into your arching ukemi. Again, Phyllis is prone, initiating as before with a deep contraction of her core muscles. Yet now she dives out, pushing both fingers and toes, squeezing in mid-back. She elevates her chest, clenching the gluteal muscles, as she simultaneously lifts the thighs to intensify the pace from the previous exercise, we now pulse up with the out breath and ease down as we inhale. We don't want to cause excessive strain on the neck, so Phyllis keeps her eyes down, the top of her head forward, and holds a clear straight line from mid-back through the crown of her head. Do a brisk set of 10 of these double arm and leg lifts. Rest, repeat. Again, give your hard working low back extensors a break by easing into this shell stretch. Take a few deep, vigilant breaths. Now revisit the ukemi for kokinagi and actively push yourself into this bow shape. Now, as Chuck receives this technique, he actively pushes into Gary's wrist, driving his toes into the mat. Having established the solid center, he can hinge powerfully backwards, engaging his gluteal muscles and his many spinal extensors. His chest, when again, as he receives this, his chest is projected up and outward. The bowstring of his spine projected from the hara forward. We've learned for sure now that before we extend the spine, we must first contract the core. And now we look at the second principle of muscular recruitment, that is to use the bottom before the top. Here in Gyakuhamni Ikkyo, Gary has to be able to insert a center of gravity underneath Chucks and express that power from the legs through a centralized elbow and a straight back. Also, Chuck, in order to neutralize that incoming power, needs to be able to have his gluteal muscles engaged so that he can absorb this power through the mass of his legs. Let's look for a couple exercises to help these guys accomplish this end. The gluteal muscle, the butt cheek, is more than just a built-in cushion. It's the most massive muscle in the body and it extends the largest bone, the femur. Down on all fours, Phyllis, as always, first contracts her core and extends one thigh. 
consciously squeezing this gluteal muscle to keep the leg level. And it's pulled outward from the heel in the mind's eye. Inhaling to prepare, she now tightens further to pulse the thigh a few inches upwards, holding her hips level, her belly still, and the upper back and neck long and straight. This action tends to pull at the lumbar vertebrae, so she has to be vigilant that her navel stays drawn inward to stabilize and protect this area. Try 10 of these thigh pulses per side. Rest and repeat. A good in-between stretch to keep our low backs happy is this cat stretch. Phyllis pulls her belly inward and away from the mat with the out breath, the tailbone and the head hanging freely. This is a great position to experience this lateral expansion of the rib cage. As she, again she exhales, Phyllis rotates her tailbone back, returning to this neutral spine. So after your two sets of thigh pulses, return to your ikkyo and in both the technique and its ukemi, intentionally squeeze your glute muscles to propel and strengthen the spine. Now let's challenge our balance as we recruit our glutes. Phyllis, besides extending her leg, also folds her opposite arm over her ribs and vividly hinging on her center of gravity, she pushes into the heel and exhaling tilts the straight spine forward. With the in-breath, she returns level, guarding this TA contraction, feeling the body from heel to crown as one coherent unit. Keep a strong sense of spinal projection, as though in traction from ankles to the neck. Do eight of these per side. Recharge with a cat stretch or two, and then return to your EQ. Don't lose this sense of calling on the largest muscle in the body to both absorb and express power. Now, we find with the new awareness that Gary has cultivated from the previous exercises, the action of the gluteal muscles forges a connection driving the heel down into the earth and the hip flexors together with this connection solidify the core. Similarly, as Chuck engages his core and contracts his glute, the extension of his leg acts as part of the spinal system now and acts as a counterweight to the force applied to the upper body. Now the force of Gary's echo finish is not isolated in the head, but is transmitted through the core and dissipated out the extended leg. Iriminage is a great technique to examine how this principle of using the bottom before the top is applied. From the very beginning, Chuck has to use his legs to unbalance, turn, lunge, and throw. How can we train him to more accurately draw power from his legs so that he can free up his upper body for its appropriate use? As we've already studied, the gluteal muscle extends the femur. We can both strengthen the glute and give ourselves a core stability challenge with this isolateral bridging exercise. Phyllis has her ankles and knees together, her palms by her sides, and one shin extended out along the line of the other thigh. With an out breath to tighten the core, she bridges the hips up, guarding them level and still with the in breath. Consciously squeezing the supporting glute, she exhales to ease the hips to the mat, keeping the low back elevated and the navel drawn inward. She inhales to prepare and exhales to begin the sequence again. Do six of these bridges per side, rest and repeat. With this exercise too, we tend to accumulate tension in the lumbar area. A good way to dispel this tension is to rock the knees side to side. The belly still solid, yet the spine shaking off tension like water off a dog. A dozen or so of these works well. Take the sense of gluteal power and core stability back to your Yuminage and try it on for size. A seemingly simple exercise, a good lunge demands excellent core stability and builds a strong, resilient stance. With her feet shoulder width apart, Phyllis strides back long, her rear foot rooted, with the toes straight ahead and the heel pulled upwards. She guards a suspended posture her shoulders are pulled back and her sternum pushed forward. 
her low back straight. She inhales to prepare, then exhaling lowers her rear knee to lightly touch the mat and returns in one smooth motion. Keep the sense of extending backwards as you ascend to counteract the tendency towards misalignment. Though the quads of the front legs are working hard, it's the gluteal muscle of this rear leg that is the prime mover here. Do 10 of these per side with perfect alignment and return to a more stable, grounded iriminage. With a clear sense of how to draw power from the legs, Chuck now lunges, pivots, lunges and stride lunges, all the while consciously recruiting the glutes. By drawing his muscular attention to the center and back of his body, he lowers his center of gravity. And this allows him to express his power like a breaking wave from legs to hands. Now, in this rotatory attack, the single arm is clearly overpowered in the attack. Gary must call on the power of his lower body to insert underneath Chuck's grip all the while guarding the centralization of the elbow. And in this kokunage, you have to express a strong shomenuchi cut with the entire skeletal system. It's very important that he maintain this clear straight line as he ascends, framing the technique with consistent core power. Let's examine a couple ways to help the guys with this. Phyllis assumes a wide stance, the rear foot at right angles to the front. She keeps her front leg straight, pulls her shoulders back, and stacks her hands at the small of her back. She now rotates her rib cage so the sternum is aligned with the big toe. And keeping her eyes slightly up with the in-breath, she projects the straight spine outward and forward until she reaches the limit of the hamstring here. She exhales to tighten inward even more on the ascent, guarding this neutral spine, and again, pulling her shoulder blades well back as she begins again. When the TA muscle and the pelvic floor are engaged, the hamstring and the gluteal muscles are here called upon to extend the straight spine by pulling on the back of the pelvis, staying deliberate with your breath and going no further than your flat back allows. Try 10 of these per side and now return to your morotatory work. We now address what is essentially the same exercise, but now done with the elbow centralized, the hand overhead, and the front leg bending in hanmi. This more exactly replicates the demands of the technique. Phyllis holds the same stance and inhaling to prepare, briskly flexes out and extends back in one strong exhalation. Notice that she reaches back with the rear hand, almost as if she is pulling herself back and up. This image in action engages our spinal extensors, which assist the posterior leg muscles in the strong return of the spine. You must be sure to apply equal, if not greater effort to this core contraction with this exercise, or you risk straining these relatively small lumbar extensors. Try up to 20 of these per side, and then give your low back and hamstrings a bit of a break by releasing forward into this forward bend. Release the tension in the neck and the jaw. Fill the sides and back with the in-breath. Then lengthen and soften these hard-working areas right, with a deep and deliberate inhalation. Hold on to the springy, buoyant feeling in your legs and back as you now revisit Kokunage. As with basic Tenkan practice, Gary positions himself below the, and behind the point of contention. Pushing his heel to initiate the strong forward projection, he cuts the straight spine forward, calling on the power of his posterior leg and hip muscles. You'll find that as you more effectively recruit the core and leg muscles, the once overtight chest and shoulders become liberated from their misguided role of movement initiator.
move onward now to our third principle of muscular recruitment, that is to recruit the back before the front. Here we have Shomenuchi Ikkyo, where it is imperative that Chuck keep underneath Gary's elbow. However, if his scapula widens or elevate, he quickly loses his connection to his core. How can we help him find that connection to the core so that he can stabilize and strengthen his mid-back and find that the pushing motion of his arm is solidly connected from the spinal line, from mid-back, out through to his fingertips. Working from all fours, Phyllis has her hands placed directly underneath her shoulders and her elbows locked. With the in-breath, she shrugs the shoulder blades together, inwards, toward the spine, and exhaling, she pushes the mats away, widening the space between the scapula. The prime movers in this exercise are the pectoral muscles, yet in focusing on the action of the scapula, we gain a clearer picture of how their placement serves to project power from the spine to the hands. And as with every exercise, Phyllis is contracting her core with the outbreath to unify her actions. Do 10 of these scapular isolations, stretch out for a few breaths, just so, and repeat. Now apply Ikkyo, giving special attention to how the movement of the scapula affects the unbalancing of your uke. Now with this modified push-up, we'll challenge the chest, shoulders, and triceps while attending to the action of the scapula. Again, Phyllis starts on all fours, but this time she holds her knees together, keeps her thighs a bit back of 90 degrees, and places the hands directly underneath the sternum, one above the other, just as you'd grip a sword. With the in-breath, she lowers her chest towards her hands, keeping the armpit squeezed tight, the elbows in. Exhaling, she tightens inward and widens the shoulder blades to return. You may notice a tendency to elevate the scapula in this movement. Don't. Keep your shoulders down, thus keeping the tension appropriately in mid-back, not in the upper traps and neck. This is a tough one. Strive for quality over range of motion. If you have great upper body strength, you can do this from the toes. But most of us will find excellent conditioning working from our knees. Now do 10 of these sword grip push-ups, rest, and then give it a shot at doing 10 more. Now return to Ikkyo, holding to the sense of wedging inward with your shoulders down and your own elbows well tucked in. With a new awareness of his scapula, Chuck's movements have an added sharpness to them. He has a sense of his arms beginning in mid-back, and his movements become bigger, more expansive. Similarly, holding this sense, when he drives into Gary's elbow, he displaces Gary's scalp, and he has a sense of moving Gary's center through his connection in his mid-back. Here in this Ryotutore Kokunage, Gary must work against Chuck's thumbs to destabilize his grip. If Chuck is committed to the grip, Gary has a solid connection to Chuck's elbows, shoulders, and spine. If Gary allows his scapula to float or his elbows to widen, however, he's left just with the strength of these small deltoid muscles in his shoulder. It can't be done. Let's look at a couple of ways that he can access the power of his legs and back and hence make more effective use of his shoulders. For these next two exercises, we'll use a flex band. They're a remarkably versatile tool for this type of work. Phyllis is using a six foot length and starts this off by looping them around the arches of her feet and puts a couple turns around her hands to prepare. With the in-breath, she allows her spine to flex forward and her shoulder blades to widen. Now tightening inward, she exhales and widens the arms, projecting her sternum towards the feet. Though it's the arms that are moving, the prime movers here are those muscles that retract the scapula. You want to cultivate a vigorous inward squeezing here at mid-spine, ensuring that your pelvis is vertical and your low back is straight. Do 10 of these scapular squeezes, rest and repeat. 
Now check out your kokanage again, guarding the stability of your upper back. A more vigorous method to challenge our back will now also involve a strong abdominal component. Phyllis has doubled up on the band for added resistance and hold it about three fifths distance between her hands directly over the sternum. With her feet together, she extends her legs out at 45 degrees and inhaling steadily lowers them to just above the mat, simultaneously squeezing wide the band with slightly bent arms, exhaling and drawing her belly inward she raises the legs back to 45 degrees with the arms returning at the same pace. By resisting the hands snapping back together, we stimulate the back muscles in both ranges of motion. Now this motion can potentially put a lot of shearing pressure on the lumbar vertebrae, so we want to give particular effort to this TA contraction, especially as the legs get closer to the mat. Should you find this at all severe, keep a bend in the knees to ease the load on your low back. This exercise is great for stimulating the connection back to front and also serves to unify the body from the core towards both ends. Try six of these at a measured pace. Rest and repeat. Now when you return to your kokinaga, you may find not only a more vivid sense of your upper back, but also a clear sensation of the role that the base of your spine plays in this technique. With the chest proud and the shoulder blades knit together, Gary can use this backward shifting of his body to momentarily insert and center underneath chucks. His arms act like the tail of a whip, manifesting the power generated in the legs, transferring it through the core, and steering action of the hands thus becomes much easier. The back now drives the front. now give some special attention to the rotational aspect of the spine and pelvis. In this ikyo ura, Chuck is striving to transmit the torsional power of his hips and back into Gary's elbow to more powerfully cut his head down to the mat. We've established our methods to stabilize both the core and the shoulder blades. Let's now examine some ways to bring awareness and power to those muscle groups that rotate the spine. For it is this range of motion, this circle on our vertical axis, that is a special spice in the mix, essential to the spiral patterns found throughout Aikido. Working from the seated position, Phyllis holds a slight curve in her spine. With one hand anchored on her knee, she hinges back, exhaling, and sweeps her free arm down by her hip. With the in-breath, she returns, reaching diagonally across the opposite knee. It's important that she leads this movement with the ribs carrying the elbow, a strong TA contraction corseting her lower spine. When you inhale in this upper position, have a sense of pushing your breath into these upper ribs, here underneath the scapula. Now it's useful to know that not all vertebrae rotate with the same range of motion. The greatest torsion in midspine is experienced here, just underneath the scapula, while the thicker, load-bearing vertebrae of the lumbar area are much more stable. Do 10 of these half rollbacks per side, then recharge, and grabbing a wrist, relax your head forward. Take a few deep breaths with a sense of widening and filling these ribs here at the side. Now return to your Ikkyo practice and hold on to that sense of mid-back rotation and with the rib cage carrying the elbows along their intended path. A bit more challenging way to build this rotational power is the oblique crossover. The oblique abdominal muscle along with the multifidus and other smaller spinal rotators provides us with the ability to both rotate and laterally flex the spine. To help ourselves more accurately recruit the obliques, Think of taking your floating ribs towards the opposite hip crest in a short, powerful contraction. Now Phyllis starts with her shins up in a tabletop position, placing her hands on her forehead. So, 
She hinges long in the back of the neck, eyes to the thighs, and as always, guarding her belly inward. She now closes the distance from rib to hip, driving the elbow towards opposite knee. You want to keep such a pace that you have time for an inhalation in transition and deliberately push the breath out as elbow crosses over towards the knee. And while the knee may touch the elbow, remember, it's this barrel-like rotation of the ribs powered by the obliques that supply this movement. Do a set of 10, rest, with both knees hugged to the chest, then repeat. This one may give you a bit of a burn. Take that muscular reference back to Ikkyo and cut through your partner using this ribcage rotation. Keeping a nice clean line from tailbone to crown, Chuck can now effectively turn on his vertical axis. As long as he keeps his shoulders down, his elbows centralized, this spinal torsion flows unhindered through, creating this powerful downward spiral. In this Shihonage from Ushiro Ryote Tori, we have, besides this ribcage rotation, a strong need for a crisp, expansive turn here at the hips. By opening his front foot, Chuck can more fully open his hips, bringing his center line to bear right at the base of Uke's spine. Many of us are quite restricted in this range of motion. Let's see what we can do to loosen this connective tissue around the pelvis and to strengthen our capacity for powerful pelvic torsion. Lying on her back, Phyllis extends one leg vertically. Now, if your hamstrings don't allow full extension, just keep a slight bend in the knee. Exhaling, she slowly eases the knee across the center line to the mat on the other side, holding this position with the in-breath, feeling the stretch along the ribs and through these smaller gluteal muscles. Careful to contract inward, she rotates back to the center line. This supine crossover is a great exercise for building an awareness of the relationship between the rib cage and pelvic rotation. The connection, of course, is the sacroiliac or SI joint, here at the base of the spine where the spine sets into the saddle of the pelvis. Try initiating alternately with either the tilting of the ribs or the hips, all the while corseting this SI joint and breathing expansively through the open side. Do eight. And on the last repetition, release into this stretch for a few more deliberate breaths, again, expanding the ribs. Now take this sense of increased pelvic mobility and revisit Shionage. We now come to flares, a vigorous use of both the oblique abdominals and the pelvic rotators. Phyllis starts in this wide stance, both palms down the back flat and the belly pulled in away from the mats. She now exhales and sweeps one leg across lightly to rest on the outside hip of the mat. Inhaling, she gathers herself and springs over to the other side, the edge of the foot projected, floating. Starting with a steady pace, she picks up the tempo a bit now, keeping her movements light and buoyant. As with the preceding exercise, keep an awareness of your SI joint, the root of your spine, and guard your core contraction. Try 12 flares, Take a couple breaths and repeat. I think you'll find that Shionage has a new feel to it. With open, crisply rotating hips, Chuck's unbalancing and throw have real snap to them. Again, we notice how the armpits must stay closed and the elbows in to access this torsional power of our hips and spine. If you pay attention, you'll also find a clear connection between the use of the thumbs and this more subtle movement at the root of our spine. And now finally, we address lateral flexion. 
in Ryotatori Kokiho. Gary has to tie everything together, moving from the inside out, moving with a strong core contraction from the bottom up, and inserting his center under uke. He also has to recruit the back before the front, effectively powering the arms from the shoulder blades, as we've studied earlier. And here, vivid torsion of the hips and ribs. But when he projects into the throw, there's this bow-like shape from the edge of his foot across the ribs and through to the fingertips. This is lateral flexion. And it's, we seldom express power this way. It's difficult to open the ribs sufficiently to accommodate the lower body's power. Here's a couple ways to help open the connective tissue between the ribs and to strengthen the spine's capacity to flex laterally. We have Phyllis seated, one heel tucked in, the other foot flat in front. The supporting hand is just behind the hip, her shoulder pulled down and back, and the armpit closed. She inhales for pair, and tightening inward, she exhales and pushes the hips up and forward, while reaching long over the line of the ears. Holding this stretch, she pushes the ribs open with the in-breath, expanding from hip to armpit. Now exhaling, she returns to her starting position, re-establishing the solid shoulder blade position. Now this movement puts considerable strain and load on the wrist and challenges the stability of our shoulder girdle. So as you reach, have a sense of actively pushing into the heel of your supporting hand and pulling your shoulder blade back towards mid-spine. A fringe benefit of this type of rib cage expansion is that you can literally increase the volume of your ribs and your lung capacity. And thus you pull the breath down into the lower lobes of the lungs where the exchange of blood gases is much more efficient. Do six of these per side and maintain this expansive feeling as you return to Kokyu Ho. With these hip elevations, we change our focus from range of motion to power. Phyllis starts with her feet crossed, the top leg forward, and her hips perpendicular to the mat. Now with a strong TA contraction, she pushes her hips vertically while reaching long over the line of the shoulders. With the in-breath, she returns, lightly touching the lower hip, and exhales to spring up and over again. As with the previous side bend, she guards her shoulder blade back to stabilize the joint. This hip elevation strengthens the outer thigh, the abdominal muscles, and the deep spinal extensors. Try 10 of these aside, rest and repeat. You might want to give your wrist a shake to dissipate the tension before returning to your Kokyu Ho. When you apply this technique, notice the role that the lateral shifting of the pelvis plays in powering this throw. Now, with this Ryotatori Kokyu Ho, you can throw without lateral flexion. But let's use this opportunity for core conditioning this offers by reaching over the line of the ears. Gary now effectively draws power from his back foot and shifts it outward over the ribs and into the fingertips. When you accurately recruit power into the outer hand, so the inner hand takes care of itself. This more than doubles the potential for power. So let's use deliberate lateral flexion to round out our core conditioning and learn to energize the respiration. Staying with lateral flexion, let's take a look at its role in ukemi. In order for Chuck to absorb the impact of this atemi, he must hold a solid center and project the force of it out through the leg, transmit it from the pelvis. Unlike previous examples, the leg here elevates and holds a clear line from the heel through the crown, connected by the solid core. Unless you're a dancer, you probably rarely challenge this abduction of the thigh, this lateral raising of the thigh. The prime mover here is a small muscle called the tensor fasciae lati that connects to a long band of connective tissue down to the heel. Right? Stimulating this augments overall stability and lower body power. Let's take a look at a few exercises that can strengthen this lateral line of force.
As with the side bend, Phyllis starts with one heel in and the other foot flat, in front, knee up. The supporting hand is here, solidly pulled in by the hip and the free arm rests over the belly. Pressing the hips up and forward, she now extends her leg outward, parallel to the mat. With the in-breath, Phyllis lowers the straight leg, lightly touching the leg and challenging her core. With the out-breath, squeeze of the legs back to the start position. As a stability challenge, let's strive to keep our hips and torso as still as we can manage. This one will catch up with you pretty quickly. Do 10 per side and revisit your Kokinage Ukemi, holding a sense of that vivid line from heel to head through your solid center. To challenge these lateral leg elevation, Phyllis now stands up using the Joe as an aid to balance. Pressing outward simultaneously to both heel and head, she exhales and rotates upon the pivot point of her hara. With the top leg parallel to the mat, she flexes up on the toes of the supporting foot, then settles this heel down with the return of the elevated leg. This action is done briskly with good extension to both fingers and toes. For a breathing pattern, we'll both elevate and return with one exhalation and gather ourselves to repeat with the in-breath. Try 10 of these standing leg elevations per side and to challenge your balance, repeat without the use of the Joe. All the while holding this core contraction and pressing deliberately into the supporting heel. Now revisit your Kokunage Ukemi and hold to this feeling of extension. Chuck keeps his focus inward and his jaw set to absorb this atemi. With the core contracted and the outer thigh engaged, the force of this strike is neutralized by this lateral flexion. Make sure that you slap the mats close to the hip to protect your rib and keep your metsuke centered on the nage to cultivate a sharp atmosphere in training. There are many ways that you can weave these exercises into your training. As a student, Try choosing one priority of movement and do a few sets of the same exercises just before class and hold on to the physical echo of this cultivated in the body and try and integrate it into your practice as you train. As a teacher, I found that splicing strong conditioning exercises between sets of the same technique to be a powerful tool in eliciting clear lines of force in the students' bodies. The students seem to be able to elicit the body's inherent wisdom when the muscle group under focus is, shall we say, on fire. Thank you for your time and attention. I sincerely hope that this material has been of use to you in your training. Ultimately, we must all find our own way on the path of Aikido. That being said, it's often useful to have a map when you're exploring new territory. This DVD is the first in a series that aims to help you discover systematically the space within and around you as you explore this marvelous madhouse called life through the practice of Aikido. I'm interested in your feedback. Please check out our website at www.aikidodojo.com Now before we part, here are a few scenes for our upcoming work exploring the connections between weapons practice and body arts training. Once again, thanks so much. Good luck and good training to you all.